today on Vital Insights. Because ultimately, um, as hospital moves toward home, that type of bandwidth, that type of scale, the low latency experience that you typically see in a corporate office, that's ultimately what's going to be needed at the home. Welcome to an episode of Vital Insights, a podcast series focused on thought leaders and healthcare providers who are working to transform the way we care for patients, now and in the future. The name AT&T has been synonymous with telephone communications, with the company's history going all the way back to Alexander Graham Bell. But after more than a century of business evolution, the company now provides the infrastructure for some of the largest business industries around the world, including healthcare. Our guest today is Joe Dragas, who is responsible for leading the global healthcare solutions team for AT&T. We've asked him to join us to share a little more about how AT&T is enabling the care of the future. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thank you, Liz. All right, I'm going to kick it off with an overview question. So people, and people being like me, associate AT&T with phone lines. Can you tell us a little about the move into the healthcare space and why that was an important one for the company as a whole? Absolutely, Liz. And first off, let me thank you for having me and for asking this question because I do fly all over the country and I feel like I have to evangelize this. So (laughs) I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to address it. Um, If you think about the shift that's happening in healthcare, connectivity really is at the core of digital transformation. And so we've been on this journey now for over a decade within AT&T, but our mission is to be the primary and premier connectivity provider for the healthcare ecosystem. And we're focused on delivering fiber connectivity solutions, mobility connectivity solutions, to enable that transformation in healthcare. So when I look at it, it makes perfectly good sense that AT&T would be laser focused in working with healthcare organizations and anywhere in that healthcare continuum to try to drive the transformation and change that's so desperately needed, not only in the United States, but across the globe. We're really excited to announce that we won recently the Digital Health Company of the Year by Frost and Sullivan. Excellent. And I'm really proud of that. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, really That's that. fantastic and totally deserved. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's a pride point uh, for me and my team. And many of us, uh, I personally have now been in healthcare for at and for over a decade. And, you know, we've had a lot of um, uh, fits and starts as, you know, any organization does to try to figure out exactly what we should be doing and where we should be focused. And I'm looking forward to sharing more about that here today. Um, But I think this is just proof that we're heading in the right direction and taking our core capabilities of being a connectivity player and using that to truly align with the industry to make meaningful change. And and I'm glad you you phrased it specifically that way because that's a nice lead into my next question for you because the issue of scalability is a is a huge one. It's a primary issue for the implementation of all sorts of new like virtual care solutions. So can you talk a little about what factors you see playing into that issue from either provider or patient or both standpoint? Absolutely. I feel like in my discussions with clients and partners every day, I often say, can you believe the world we're living in currently and what has transpired in the last 18 months? I know. And I just would have never thought I know. this would have happened. And um, so now imagine, imagine the way you felt in March of 2020 when suddenly I remember very clearly for me, I, at the time I was in Dallas, even though now I live in Dallas, but I was living in Atlanta. I traveled back to Atlanta for the first time and uh, had no idea that I was going to be grounded uh, for the next you know, year and a half almost. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I immediately went from traveling around, working from different places, going into an office to working and operating out of my home. And that shift, of course, happened all across the United States and all across the globe. Um, AT&T's network on average now 
460 petabytes of, petabytes of data crosses our network. And that's up 40% year over year. And so it's hard to kind of fathom, wow. you know, a petabyte, let alone 468. But just to kind of try to put that into perspective, that's the equivalent of streaming nearly 100 million two hour long movies in HD. So that's just every single day on average, 468 petabytes. And last year we saw that increase 40% year over year. This year we expect that to continue to increase uh, by the same margin. And we saw a 51% increase in the text rate during the pandemic. And I mean, lots of interesting pandemic st stats and I'll bring it back for a minute, but let me just give you a couple more interesting ones. Um, yeah, go for it. Our, our traffic, um, our conferencing traffic during the pandemic last year, so if you compare 20 to 19, it increased by more than a billion minutes of use. And we saw a tripling of the normal demand for WebEx meetings during the pandemic. And all these things, you can understand why, but think about now, Liz, when you were at your home and, and instead of being in the office, you basically converted your home into an office and that happened all across the country and all across the globe. It was a major pressure test of the AT&T network. And I'm so proud of the way our network team had worked because we have been on this journey for many years, shifting from traditional networking to software defined networking. And by making that shift in the core of the AT&T network, it essentially gives us the ability to flex and to scale and to be less distributed with the network in, in traditional networking. So if this pandemic and this shift would have happened many years ago before we made the shift to software defined networking, we would have never been able to handle that capacity or load because it happened nearly overnight. Yep. And yet if you think back toward your experiences and certainly people in different areas had connectivity challenges, so I don't wanna minimize that, but largely the network was able to handle and flex and shift almost overnight to you know, a totally different topology. And so I guess all that to say, we're very bullish and excited about the way through software defined networks, you know, we will be able to handle the shift and the scale and the transformation, especially as it moves toward the home. Because ultimately um, as hospital moves toward home, that type of bandwidth, that type of scale the low latency experience that you typically see in a corporate office, that's ultimately what's gonna be needed at the home in order to handle that shift. And I think we've proven now through the pandemic and you know, now again with Delta surging and a lot of people that were moving back to the office have shifted back toward home. I think it continues to get tested and the network is standing up very well. So I, I like the alliteration that you just made about um about working in the home and and where my mind immediately went was, okay, well then how do we take that concept that you were just talking about of, of the hospital and put it into the home? Um, so you feel comfortable with the ability for us to reach that point? I do, and I think it's one of the differentiating points of AT&T and I think why we're really excited um, to continue this journey of being the premier connectivity provider in healthcare because we really combine the wired and fiber assets with the wireless and 5G infrastructure. And networking in the future is really going to be both. The, the lines are really becoming blurred between wired and wireless. And I think as the hospital shifts to the home, it's going to be critically important that we can engineer networks and workflows and patient care in such a way that um, it's mobile, it can go remote, um, it's hospital and it's home. And so I think as we're thinking about the care being provided at the home, we're thinking about broadband solutions that connect to the home, we're thinking about wireless connectivity to the home um, and enabling that mobility. And so I absolutely feel comfortable that the network will be able to perform. And the network is really going to be a combination of wired and wireless going forward. 
That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to shift gears just a tiny little bit, although we've already touched on this, but where do you see this convergence of technology and healthcare having the most impact? If you look at kind of the existing care continuum, um, we've, we've talked a little bit about in the home, and I'd love to hear you expand on that a little bit further. Well, I'm super excited about the prospects of 5G, and we're already seeing a lot of shift and transformation that's been driven by 5G. Faster speeds, lower latency, greater security, and just massive connectivity. And we really see 5G transforming both what's happening in the hospital as well as the home. And so I think that's some of the transformation that we're gonna see um, happen so quickly with technology. And so let me give you a little bit of insight as to uh, where we see this going. So if you think about the, the hospital experience, uh, and there are a lot of areas for improvement within the hospital, we really are already seeing creating 5G environments within hospitals is not that difficult. We can create very high speed, low latency networks within confined areas much more easily than we can create them externally. So that's why you're already seeing stadiums and airports and various venues move toward 5G. You'll start to and continue to see us leading our hospital partnerships in the same direction. And so a lot of times when I talk to hospitals, I try to get them to dream and imagine if you could completely untether your patients and your clinicians within the facility, what would that do to care? What could you do in the future that you haven't been able to do because now you have untethered, really high bandwidth and really low latency connectivity within the hospital. Um, anytime I frequent in a hospital, I, I, you know, I'm just blown away by the amount of connections and things that are wired and plugged in and yeah, things yeah. that aren't mobile, you know, and even the carts, you know, are sure they're wheeling, but they're still kind of big and clunky. And you think about how could all of that get transformed within the hospital down to a tablet or smaller device to where all that data that I'm trying to capture either about the patient that's either on per person, you know, vitals or history charts and even information about um, other treatments um, all across the globe. How can I take all that data and bring it down to the point of care uh, to make a decision right at the bedside. And I think we're going to be moving quickly in that direction as we 5G enable more and more hospitals. And so I, I think of massive shift and transformation that'll start to take place in the hospital as a result of 5G. And then similarly, I think about the shift now toward the home and the exciting capabilities when you start to think about taking the care that started in the hospital and moving it to the home and being able to manage chronic conditions in the home, get vitals from a patient, alert a caregiver, alert the patient back that, hey, we need to quickly establish a video consult because we see something that's alarming us. So that shift toward the home, and I think 5G is going to continue and enable that as well because in a similar fashion, while I think 5G is going to drive a lot of innovation within the hospital, I think having that high speed, low latency connection that's always on and makes it seamless for the transition from hospital home, I think is going to really drive a lot of innovation and frankly, just improve healthcare altogether as well. Absolutely. And in terms of accessibility to healthcare, in terms of, you know, just reaching out to people that really need healthcare, but maybe can't get to the doctor's office or maybe can't um, talk to their doctor on a regular basis, I think we're going to see a huge impact there. Um, so that is very exciting to me as well. Um, next question. So what solutions in the healthcare space do you feel hold the most promise? We've talked about providers a little bit, but from a patient population standpoint. So if you think of those critical care patient populations, people with chronic illnesses, um, people we really want to support as they age in place, what solutions do you feel hold the most promise for those populations? 
Yeah, if you think about what's happened in the last 18 months, so many individuals in the U.S. and globally had never interacted with a caregiver virtually before. Yeah, yep. And many people had their first virtual consult over the last 18 months. And, you know, I think in general, a lot of the feedback is, I would have never done this. COVID made me have to do it. But since I was sort of forced, it actually worked better than I thought. In fact, I've heard a lot of people say, I don't even really necessarily want to go back. Why don't I just do this all the time? So I think, um, you know, that it's been a very hard year in so many ways, year and a half. Um, and we still have challenges ahead, but there were some silver linings. I think COVID has fast forwarded innovation in healthcare um, in, a, in a significant way. And so I, I think while that virtual consult really exploded, that concept, which is, you know, very similar to just a FaceTime or a Zoom or a WebEx type um, consult. Uh, that technology now exists very commonly across many of the provider systems across the country. Most, most of us would, you know, have the ability to find a provider who could offer that sort of services. And that's great. What hasn't yet taken off is that sort of that next layer uh, remote patient monitoring. Um, so the so the concept of on starring the human body is kind of how <laughs> I like to think about it. That's right? a great so, analogy. I love that permission to use that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please, please do. And 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 it is. It's a great analogy because people can get their head around. Um, I can unlock my car remotely. I I can tell the car has broken down. I can. Um, I can see that it's time to come in for repairs. You know, that, that same concept, why don't we have the same capabilities for the human body? And I am just super excited to see all these great startup companies coming out with really, really innovative ways to extract vitals from the body and come up with easy to use ways to alert clinicians. And so that, Liz, is where I really see a huge opportunity that's gonna drastically shift access to healthcare across the United States and across the globe. The ability to take somebody with a chronic condition and connect that person virtually to a caregiver, to be able to be proactive around healthcare, to be able to quickly spin up a virtual consult and to say, Liz, I would like you to come in immediately or, oh, false alarm, Liz, you're fine. Please stay at home where you're comfortable. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. And uh, I just got back from the Hims conference a couple of weeks ago in Las Vegas um, and met with a lot of different companies that are you're really innovating in this space. And so I'm excited about where I think we can play the role at and in providing that secure, reliable, high bandwidth connectivity and helping these companies think through how do you, you know, what's the form factor, what's the device, what's the patient interaction and experience like, and then how do you handle this logistically? Cause it's gonna, that's gonna be a big shift as well. Oh, yes. Most care has taken place in the hospital and now most of it's gonna, you know, take place not only in the hospital, but also in the home. So there's even just a big logistical piece that'll have to be worked out for a lot of these systems in terms of how do you handle, you know, care now that it gets very distributed. Absolutely. Um, so you talked a little bit about supporting those patients in their homes. What do you see as the necessary infrastructure for supporting them? Um, are there pieces that need to be mobilized and moved into place? Is there an educational component that needs to be you know, brought to bear, what, what, are, what are you seeing as the kind of current holes that need to be filled? Yeah, top of the list would be highly reliable and highly secure networks. So if we now want to give the patient the assurance that your vitals are getting collected, extracted, analyzed, and we're going to be sending alerts, it's got to work. Yeah. Because you can't, you, you know, for the patient's perspective, it's like, 
hey, I now I'm being watched, which is awesome, but it has to always be on. So the reliability aspect is mission critical because now it's it's a whole different ball game when you go from um, you know something that is periodic to always on. So I think reliability is huge. Secure cannot be overemphasized in healthcare um, because the bad actors are increasing and there are uh, many different threats now coming in at all different angles, trying to gather personal health information. And so those two things really have to come together. You know, it's been part of uh, various panels and discussions. And one of the things I continue to hear about, so why hasn't remote patient monitoring really taken off? Two of the most common things I hear is access still continues to be a challenge, rural, remote, don't have it. So that's one. The other one that comes up a lot is ease of use. And so I, I was like, I love my mother, but I love to give the example of if I'd send mom like this whole kit and a whole bunch of stuff and go, all right, mom, <laughs> like get this on your Wi-Fi, connect these Bluetooth devices. Now I could send that to my kids and they could do it in like two minutes. Right. And right. my mom would be like, she's not even going to open that. She's like, are you <laughs> kidding me? Like, you know, bring over the IT staff. So ease of use is also a real challenge as well. And so I think as we've kind of stepped back at at and and healthcare and said, where can we really help? So we have the connectivity capabilities and layers. And let me double click on that just for a second. Um, 20 years ago, when the tragic events of 9-11 happened, one of the big ahas was that the first responders couldn't communicate because everybody immediately jumped on their mobile right, devices right. and flooded the network and locked up the network. So the government launched the first res- responder authority and um, they put out a, an RFP to build the nation's only first responder network. Uh, and so we've been on this journey now and at and has been selected as the contractor to build the, governor, the government's network. And we never even knew what was yet to come through COVID-19 when we started this adventure uh, four years ago. But the, the first net authority has also recognized healthcare and remote patient monitoring as use cases um, in which the network um, can be used to support. And so one of the ways that we feel like uh, we can provide an even differentiated and superior experience for connectivity is by leveraging that first net infrastructure to provide prioritized, highly secure connectivity um, into the homes. And with the building of the first net, it's also given us the ability to reach a lot of places rurally that we haven't been able to reach before with wireless connectivity. So one of the ways we're trying to solve the access challenges is by building solutions that leverage the first net network in order to get to reach and to get to rural and to get to places maybe that don't have broadband, don't have traditional connectivity. The other side, you know, the, the ease of use challenge if you think about what AT&T does in the consumer world, we ship tens of thousands of mobile devices all over the, the world on a daily basis. Sure. We bring in devices, we swap them, we, we destroy them. We, it, there's a huge logistics component to what we do. And so we've taken a lot of what we've done and learned in that space and said, we could help with just some of the logistic challenges. So now if if we're gonna start sending chronic condition patients kits and, and Bluetooth peripherals and devices and all these different things, how can we help manage and support those different workflows and, and make it easy and pre-configure so that way, now when my mother opens up the kit to manage her chronic condition, it's all preloaded, it's power on, and anything that has to connect automatically connects through the first net network and ultimately back to the caregiver. So that's the way we think we can kind of come in and 
solve some of these challenges um, to help transform healthcare and this shift toward the home. That's fantastic. You guys have very clearly been really busy. <laughs> it's, um, a, it's great. It's a mission, Liz. It's um, it's one of the things that makes uh, makes my job really rewarding. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, it's uh, it's it's a totally different mission because we're not, uh, you know, it's it's not a mission to uh, you know make widgets or make money. It's really a mission to improve healthcare, and and it's near and dear to all of our hearts, right? Everybody. You know, we all need health care and we all have loved ones that, you know, need it. Um, and so it's 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 really a neat mission to think about how do we transform and create change that's very much needed. And that is a perfect tee up to my last question of the day for you, which is if you could take a moment and just dream a little for me, what do you see as the future of patient care in your mind? What does it look like? Well, one thing is for certain that virtual care is here to stay and I agree. remote patient monitoring is, <laughs> yeah, remote patient monitoring is, we, we haven't even scratched the surface of what it's going to look like. Um, I'll kind of take it from let's walk into the hospital and then let's walk out of the hospital. I, you know, still too often across the country, you walk into a hospital, you walk up to a desk, you, you get a clipboard, you're manually filling out information that <laughs> they already know about you. And, and then somebody's got to sort of check you in and maybe take your temperature manually. Now that's a new thing. And then, and there's a fax the, machine over in the corner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I, I laugh and cry at the same time. I think about yeah. how different that is, even then, um, even then now, you know, walking into a bank or even an airport or, you know, different places where the digital transformation has, you know, has happened so much sooner. So, you know, I think part of the way I envision the future looking is when I walk into the hospital, they already know it's me. Um, I'm already checked in because uh, they already know that about me because of the association maybe with my mobile device. I, I don't have to fill anything out. And by the way, if I write, you can't read it anyways, but I don't <laughs> even have to fill something out on a, a keyboard because again, that shift in that data transfer already happens. Um, there's seamless ways to check my temperature. The, the nurse is already alerted uh, that I'm, you know, here and healthy and available. And, um, and then my experience in the clinic or in the hospital is much less like a traditional hospital experience and much more like a hospitality experience. So how, how is my stay um, far more patient centered and entertaining um, than what it traditionally has been? I mean, look, we, we don't want to spend time in hospitals. It's not, it's not a fun place to be, No, definitely. but not. can we, can we improve the experience? Can we, you know, with, virtual reality and augmented reality and um, with mobile entertainment. Um, can, and we're doing some of this stuff today. I'm really proud of the work we're doing with the Ellison Institute in LA. And, and they're really on an, on an incredibly exciting journey. But part of the way they've thought about this is for patients and visitors, how do you, how do you track and know where the patient is? So that way you can tailor the experience and send them alerts and help them navigate the facility. I mean, all these things I think that would be, you know, patient and visitor and clinician centered versus the, you know, the experience in so many places today, which is, this is what the box is. Now, when you come in, here's how you navigate our box. You know, how do you flip it the other way? How do you make it all about the patient and all about the experience? So I, it's super excited when I dream about um, for the times that we have to visit hospitals and clinics, it being flipped to welcome Liz. We're glad you're here. And now we're going to tell you the experience for you. So that's kind of in the hospital. I think in the home that the way it transitions um, is a really exciting to dream about as well. Cause let's say um, I was in the hospital and I was getting treated for you know, a condition. And now I have to leave with a cardiac monitor and some other, some other devices. 
could the devices that were sitting in the hospital just very easily and seamlessly now transition to my home mm. without me as the patient even having to do anything? I don't have to configure it or any, I literally just have to transport it and bring it home. So the same things that were being used to maybe even administer care to me in the hospital, could those same devices now be used and worked at home? So can the home now shift to even more than just monitoring, which we're not even quite there yet, but could it even shift now beyond monitoring to actually care? So can technology help enable care at the house even more than just doing the monitoring? So I think there's a ton of possibilities, Liz. I think connectivity is really at the heart of it. Um, and I think it's all the innovators that are out there too that are dreaming up these things. That's one thing that you, you won't see us necessarily dreaming up the device, but what we do wanna do is shore up and help provide that secure, reliable connectivity. So all these things become possible in the future. Absolutely. Well, I love that dream and I am very supportive of it. So um, I want to thank you for taking the time and, and joining us today. I know our listeners are going to love hearing what you have to say or have loved hearing what you have to say. Um, and, and I wanted to encourage you to keep dreaming on all of our behalf. Um, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Liz. 